Okay, we've got the red red dot. Hello to everyone who is here with us. Um, uh, so, uh, hello, my name is Kelia Silvis. My pronouns are she, her, and I am the vice president at the University of Minnesota School of Public Health Student Senate, SPHSS. So before we begin the structural oppression seminar, we need to acknowledge that due to current events the past weeks, people may be experiencing different feelings in response. Some people may be feeling anger or grief or numbness or many other feelings. We wanna give you space to support and honor whatever you may be feeling or experiencing. Take care of yourself today in whatever way feels good to you. I'm also going to be posting some resources in the chat and um, if you have any other resources, feel free to, to post those as well. We cannot solve violence without confronting white supremacy and systems of structural oppression. So I'm grateful that we are having this seminar today. And I am grateful to all of you for being a community with us. The School of Public Health community prioritizes health equity. So the SPHSS is making it our priority too. In partnership with the School of Public Health's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion team, we have hosted these structural oppression seminars this spring to shine a light on systems of structural oppression that impact the work of public health. For accessibility, we will have live captions available, and this recording will be made available to everyone who is registered afterwards. And now, before we begin the actual talk with, with Rebecca, I'm going to make a land acknowledgement. The University of Minnesota Twin Cities is a land grant institution located on the traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of the Dakota people. The University of Minnesota and the School of Public Health owe an ongoing debt to the Dakota people and have a duty to create healthy dialogue, relationships, and practices that redress this injustice as well as others related to the indigenous peoples of this state. Um, and I'm gonna post another link related to that. So with this grounding, I am delighted to introduce Rebecca Israel Cross. Rebecca is a health equity researcher and a doctoral candidate at the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health in the Department of Community Health Sciences. Her research involves measuring racism related uh, social determinants of health. Broadly, she, <laughs> aims to unpack the relationships between racism, neighborhoods, and health. We are so excited to have Rebecca here to share her insight and expertise with that. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to her. Awesome. Uh, let me make sure, can y'all hear me okay? All right. Um, so thank you so much for that uh, gracious introduction, uh, Kelia, and thank you and Dr. Hardiman for inviting me to speak um, for this seminar series today. Um, um, and additionally, thank you for all the logistics uh, that you have been taking care of behind the scenes in the past few months. I think you originally asked me to do this talk last year um, in you know late 2020. And so we, we were able to figure it out. So I'm really grateful um, to be a part of this series and also to be the last um, seminar for, for the year, you know, as, as folks are, going into their summers, whatever that looks like um, for you all. I'm hoping to give you some things to think about, um, particularly for those of us who are um, situated in schools of public health, um, who are doing public health research or, or public health practice. Um, I'm hoping that this, is, this conversation um, can be helpful for you. Um, so I think we are going to hold questions until the end. Um, so if you have a burning question while I'm talking, please feel free to put it in the chat. Um, I think Kelia will be monitoring the chat and um, then we'll get to those questions at the end. Um, I don't believe in hour long talks. Um, so this talk will be about 35 minutes or so and then we'll try to use the rest uh, of the time just for discussion questions and, and resource sharing too. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. So the, the name of the talk, um, as you all know, is uh, How Does Public Health Perpetuate Racism? And it's um, what I'm calling a, a disciplinary self-critique rooted in um, critical race theory. Um, so again, my name is Rebecca Israel Cross. My Twitter handle is on the screen. Um, and I am a member of the Moore Lab that is led by Dr. Rachel Hardiman. Um, and I'm a doctoral candidate at the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health. 
Okay, so before we get started, um, like Helia, I wanted to acknowledge the feelings of grief and pain and anger that many, many, many of us are feeling, um, especially our colleagues um, and friends in Minnesota right now. Um, so the murder of George Floyd, and I think particularly people watching the murder from across the around the world, kind of really kind of sent shockwaves for some people. Um, more so than other police murders than we have seen in recent years. And I'm not really sure why that is, um, but there have been tons and tons of, of conversations um, and discussions around um, the, the racism that is kind of historical and contemporary in, in the United States and really foundational um, to, to this nation, to this country. Um, and just last week, as we all know, his murderer was convicted and there were a lot of conversations about whether or not his conviction was actually justice. Um, and so I think we can probably all agree on this call that it wasn't justice, right? Justice would be George Floyd being alive today. Um, and, but other conversations have come up um, suggesting that this conviction instead was accountability. And so I actually wanna disagree with that as well. So I, I think that the conviction um, was right, but I don't think it was accountability. I think it was punishment. Um, and so this is really coming from my understanding of what accountability actually means. Um, and I borrow uh, my understanding from Miriam Kaba, who was an organizer um, and, and prison industrial complex abolitionist. And she suggests that a system that is inherently racist and classist and violent can't really hold anyone else accountable without actually producing more harm. So instead she subscribes to a framework of transformative justice that says we can create space to, to allow people to hold themselves accountable. Um, so on a very small scale, this is what I hope to do today um, is to really shine some light on things that I've been thinking about for the past few years in my program um, that might help us as public health folks, um, wherever you stand, um, help, help us hold ourselves accountable for the ways that we inflict harm um, in, inside and outside of our field. Um, so the theoretical backdrop for the talk for today is critical race theory. Um, and I often refer to it as CRT just for, for shorthand. So just, just for your, your knowledge on that. Um, but it's a body of work that is concerned with power dynamics that undergird racism and racialization in laws and social institutions. Critical race theory was developed in the United States in the 1980s by legal scholars who really questioned um, the ability of non-discrimination in civil rights law to substantially change the material lives of black people. Um, critical race theory emerged as a theoretical lens through which to examine racialized social structures and interactions in order to understand and transform the relationship between race, racism, and power. Um, so critical race theory has been explicitly um, applied to health sciences research in the past decade or so to examine uh, the role of racism and racialization in health research and health outcomes. And so this work has answered questions such as, why do police kill black people with impunity? How does statistically adjusting for race and regression models actually obfuscate racism? And how do black youth interpret the ubiquity of racism in the context of the Flint water crisis? So why then am I turning the lens on public health, right? We can think about public health as a social science that kind of examines the world um, and how certain, particularly when we're thinking about like social epidemiology, um, how certain social exposures impact the health um, of populations. Um, but racism is not just something that happens out there, right? Again, when we talk about, uh, despite what uh, Vice President Kamala Harris has recently said, we can talk about, you know, uh, the United States being a fundamentally racist country, it is. And we can also talk about public health and other social sciences being fundamentally racist. You know, we pride ourselves um, on being progressive with goals of achieving health equity. But when you study our history um, and our contemporary norms and practices, you will see that the field has white supremacist roots um, and current norms that will prevent us from actually reaching those goals of health equity. In 2010, Chandra Ford, who was my advisor, um, and Dr. Kyle, Kyle Darren Blua introduced the public health uh, critical race praxis as one approach for incorporating the tenets of critical race theory um, in public health research. 
And in this article, they argue that disciplinary self-critique helps a discipline to shine a light on itself from within in order to understand how its norms may reproduce these disparities within the discipline or in society at large. So in other words, we have to think about how we perpetuate racism as a discipline in ways that ultimately harm the communities that we claim to serve. Additionally, I don't think that we're actually doing good work as scientists or doing good science unless we continuously critique ourselves in order to become better at what we do. And lastly, I'm turning the lens on public health because I believe uh, in the potential of the discipline to be liberatory. Now, let me be clear, I don't think that we are anywhere near there, but if we crit criticize ourselves and our norms and our practices perpetually, we can inch closer and closer to that goal. So um, critical race theory has a number of core themes, all of which I can't touch on in this talk um, due to time, but I'll be talking about five that I think are relevant for our discussion, our discussion on structural oppression um, that's embedded in our discipline. Um, and the first is race as a social construct. So this is kind of um, a statement that we all say, we kind of learn in sociology 101, race is not biological, it's social. Um, and, and I think because maybe we're all attending this seminar that's dedicated to structural oppression, and maybe because we're in the moment that we're in in society where we're kind of finally paying attention to racism in, a, in what seems like it may be some real ways, um, that we actually may have a distorted view of how race is treated in public health. In other words, right now we may downplay the field's tendency to biologize or naturalize race and overinflate the field's emphasis on the study of racism. One example of how this matters is my own life, um, which has to do with um, my mother's cancer diagnosis a couple years ago. So she was diagnosed with multiple myeloma, which is cancer of the blood plasma um, in 2018. And, um, because I am a social scientist and not an oncologist, I had no idea what multiple myeloma was. And so being the person that I was and am student that I was, I hit the internet and did my Googles. I did my PubMed searches and all these things. And I really wanted to better understand, you know, how could she have gotten this cancer and what were kind of our best steps moving forward in terms of you know what were the what were the best treatment options and how could we maximize her um, being in remission or, or getting to remission um, from where we were so luckily she's in remission now um, but what I kept coming across a website across a uh, website after website after website was black race is a risk factor for multiple myeloma every website, um, you know, black people were two to three times more likely to have multiple myeloma, multiple myeloma excuse me, um, than white people. And so one, as somebody who was a scientist, I was very frustrated because this is, this is you know, treating black race as if there's something about black people's body that makes them more susceptible to multiple myeloma. And then as a daughter of somebody who is experiencing this disease, I was very frustrated because that doesn't actually help us do anything to better her treatment, right? We can't change our race to something other than black, um, at least not in this structure, we can't. Um, and so I was very frustrated. Um, and so I kept reading, um, digging further and further and further into research articles and found that actually um, one of the main risk factors for multiple myeloma was exposure to toxic environmental toxins. And so as most of us on this call know that black people are more likely to be exposed to environmental toxins. And so for me, what, we, what I see us doing when we use race as a proxy for other things that are more social or we're, we're using, we're treating race as it's biological when it's actually um, a stand in for these other types of social exposures that actually have nothing to do with what our skin color is or you know, what our ancestry is. Um, we actually do a disservice and we individualize something that is a social determinant of health. So even though right now we may be in a moment where racism is at the forefront of the public health imaginary, we still have a long way to go. And so what you're seeing on your screen right now is a simple search um, in PubMed 
uh, for black race in quotes, where the majority of the articles here treat black race as a biological or genetic characteristic. So why might this be the case? So we can think about the um, NIH, or for those of you who are not you know, in public health, the National Institutes of Health, um, their funding priorities, um, you know, how much funding is designated to studying racism versus how much funding is de designated to the study of genetic determinants of racial health disparities. Um, we could also think about genetic exp that genetic explanations have the potential to be profitable through the development of biomedical interventions. So you can think about things like um, uh, the uh, high blood pressure medicine vital that was uh, uh, promoted to be for use uh, in African American populations, um, which was a completely racist notion, right? Um, but on the flip side, when you think about structural interventions that might really make a dent in understanding um, and eliminating structural oppression and structural racism, those interventions will tend to cost money um, and not generate profits, right? So these are things that we have to think about as a field. Who is benefiting from the construction of racial health disparities as genetic problems versus um, social problems? So really to drive the point home, um, in 1994, Dr. Thomas Levise published an article in Health Services Research about the uncritical ways in which race is used as a variable in regression models. So it's still concerning today that scholars are using black race to signify a cause of any particular health outcome um, without really interrogating what they mean by race or for that matter, what they mean by cause. Um, it should no longer be acceptable in our research to ignore how racism contributes to inequalities in health. And if we look a little bit deeper, it can be sometimes a little bit more subtle than naturalizing race. So what do I mean by that? Uh, one relevant example is the coronavirus vaccinations. So we've all heard the stories about vaccine hesitancy. Um, and I think this is a really neat and tidy way to explain the disparities that we're seeing with the uptake of the vaccine. However, what if the focus on hesitancy is actually distracting us from the fact that the vaccine rollout was inequitable to begin with? What if the communities uh, most in need of the vaccine were not prioritized to start with? So I can give you two very clear cut examples. Um, in Washington Heights in New York City, where the population is approximately 98 Dominican, um, there were vaccine centers um, with no Spanish interpreters, no Spanish trans, uh, no Spanish translated uh, documents, right? So how can we then say that that's vaccine hesitancy if they're not getting vaccinated there when there's actually zero access for the people who are living in that community? Another example is, you know, if there's a vaccine center, um, which there is, in Dodger Stadium in Los Angeles, where the surrounding community is almost completely Asian and Latino, what are we, how, and, and they don't have access to cars, we're not creating an equitable system when um, we're requiring that in order to get a vaccine, you have to go through a drive-through, right? So moving forward, um, as researchers and practitioners, we should not just blame medical mistrust, which is a real and valid issue, um, but we should also consider the ways in which the systems reproduces these inequalities. So um, I would also be remiss if I didn't add that the same can be seen on the global scale. So we often hear narratives about how corruption and poor infrastructure might make the vaccine rollout in the global South ineffective, when in reality, we, the United States and billionaires like Bill Gates are not allowing other countries to affordably produce these vaccines, right? So we are creating these capitalistic barriers um, and really wrecking, wreaking havoc um, on uh, these countries where COVID is spreading faster and faster and faster, right? We can really stop that, but we want to make money off these patents, right? So um, it's important to consider that um, in the past year, there have been a number of calls um, from the NIH that who I'm very, you know, obviously critical of, but um, I have to acknowledge and give credit where credit is due. Um, the, uh, for, for proposals on structural racism. And um, what you're seeing on your screen here, excuse me, is a, a request for um, abstracts for um, health affairs. And so these are obviously two mainstream or well, one journal um, and the kind of the, the biggest funding agency in, in, in our field. And so this is important where right? we have to acknowledge that this is important that they're actually naming racism um, and asking for scholarship to be done on racism and health. 
Um, but what I fear is that racism will become a new hot topic study, right? An opportunity for folks to chase publications and chase funding. And what will continue to fall by the wayside are the real ways in which racism is literally killing people. And to go a bit further, when you dig into the NIH call in particular, you find some nuances that are concerning. So they specifically mention that purely qualitative projects are not el eligible for this funding. Right, so we can get into the details of this later, but that leads me into uh, my next theme um, for critical race theory, uh, which is narrative and counter storytelling. So in the field of public health, qualitative research, and especially that in the form of narratives, is severely undervalued in our field. Public health, like most social sciences, has its roots in positivist logic, which emphasizes statistical analyses. And so critical race theory doesn't suggest that we abandon quantitative methodologies altogether, but it recognizes that racial statistics have helped to justify racism dating back to the eugenics movement. Although they are seemingly unbiased, statistics can promote white supremacist ideologies because they rely on human data collection, analysis, and most importantly, interpretation. Statistics can play a role in liberating public health if they're used to highlight health inequalities at the population level and injustices at the macro level, such as discriminatory policies and institutional arrangements. And so this does not include saying that Black race is a risk factor for anything. And, you know, but while statistical methodologies are useful for answering many, many questions, they are limited in their ability to elevate the voices and the narratives and the stories of marginalized communities. Qualitative data, such as personal narratives and counter storytelling, are often better positioned to capture the nuances of racialized experiences. So we shouldn't expect, for example, that the same social exposure has the same impact on health across time and space, which is what we're expecting when we kind of compare, uh, you know, racism in New York and racism in Georgia. Um, and we think that this is going to tell us something meaningful in the regression model, right? Um, narratives and other form of qualitative data can help us sort through some of the inconsistencies that we see when we do quantitative analyses. Um, qualitative data can also help us explain no results. So right now, what we currently have is a system where, you know, when you have no results, publishers don't really want to publish that. <laughs> um, and so when you get no results, you either move on to something more interesting or statistically significant in your findings, or you throw that paper away and you go on and move on to the next um, set of analysis, analyses. But what, quanti what qualitative data can help us understand is, okay, if we thought that from our theory that these things should be related, qualitative data can help us dig into why these things are not related. Um, and that leads me to my last point, which is qualitative data um, can pinpoint mechanisms that are linking racism to health. And I don't just mean uh, intervening variables or mediators um, in the statistical sense, but actual processes that link the exposures to the health outcomes or that link exposures to inequities in health. Um, these mechanisms are often not really easily found um, just through looking at big data or quantitative data. So the next theme I wanna talk about is um, the critical race theory critique of liberalism. So liberalism is an ideology um, or ideological framework that prioritizes personal rights, liberty, and equal opportunity. Um, and so these rights and freedoms are what we call negative rights or procedural rights, but they're not substantive. What do I mean by that? Um, they give us the freedom from interference um, but they don't give us the freedom to actually thrive. So for example, we have the right to due process. Well, at least some of us have the right to due process, um, but we don't have the right to healthcare or the right to housing or the right to nutritious food, right? Or the right to safety. Um, so it allows us as public health scholars to talk about, the, talk about health equity, for example, in the abstract, um, while at the same time refusing to support measures um, that would actually ensure equal outcomes. And so closely related to the critique of liberalism is the, the critical race theory theme of interest convergence. So Derek Bell, who's often called the father of, of CRT, um, developed a theory that 
um, apparent racial progress um, or civil rights gains for black people were only possible to the extent that they also served the interests of white people. He used the example of Brown v. Board. Um, so we all are familiar with Brown v. Board, which ended uh, legal segregation in public schools. Excuse me. So after decades of legal fights to end school segregation, Brown v. Board ends it in one fell swoop. So Bell argues that it wasn't because the Supreme Court was all in a sudden empathetic to the plight of Black people, but instead that this ruling served the country's interests. After all, how could we keep up our image of freedom and equality during the Cold War when we still had legal segregation in schools? So that's kind of the understanding of what interest convergence is in the broad. Um, so what is this graph and why is it on this page and what does it have to do with it? <laughs> um, this is a Google Trends search for racism and anti-racism in the past year. And so as you can see, there's a peak of interest in racism and anti-racism across the country um, in the week after George Floyd was murdered. It is important to note how much how little the, the increase was in um, anti-racism compared to racism. The racism is in red and anti-racism is in blue. So that's another conversation for another time. But um, then the interest after this peak, after George Floyd was murdered, this interest returns to normal. So through the lens of interest convergence, we might explain this by thinking about how many folks were expected to say something about racism last summer to make themselves appear like they weren't racist, right? So this is on a national scale. Um, what might this look like um, in uh, public health? So last year, um, after George Floyd was murdered and I began kind of seeing all of these statements around, you know, people all of a sudden caring about racism, I um, started to do an analysis of the School of Public Health um, statements that were coming out of the, the top 25 ranked schools. Um, and so my questions really were around how were schools framing police violence and how did they plan on responding? Um, and so generally I found that most schools frame police violence as a part of a long history of anti-Black racism in the United States, which is correct. Um, but then when it came to what is the public health responsibility and what is the responsibility for the School of Public Health um, in addressing structural violence, schools really only suggested workshops, trainings, and conversations. So we have to really think about what work are we doing in the field when we're calling for equity and freedom and health for all, but despite the massive resources and powers that and power that we have at our historically white institutions, only have trainings and workshops to offer. So I should say, I should add that the analysis is not complete, right? We, we're not even a year um, since all these statements came out and um, a number of folks have changed their hiring practices, a number of folks have put out these calls. Um, for more for more scholarships, so those are important to consider. Um, there have been, like I said, all these calls for um, scholars who study racism, and that's really good. So I will have new analyses soon, or updated analyses um, soon. Um, and and this call for scholars who are studying racism is good. But we can't just incorporate racism scholarship and think that the work for health equity is done. So as University of Minnesota alum, Dr. Siri Alang talks about in her tweet here, the institutional support must continue into the action that is required, or we're going to continue to find ourselves in the cycle that you saw on the last page, right? This means that public health institutions can't just focus on what makes them look like they care about racism. We have to actually think about and do work that is anti-racist. Um, and so this is what um, according to Bell, allows racism to remain per a permanent facet in our society is that there is only as much give as it benefits white people. And that is the, one of the fundamental problems according to Bell. Okay, so I wanna use the rest of my time, we're at um, half past, so I wanna use the rest of my time to talk about um, what we can do differently through the social construction of knowledge. And so this is the final theme um, that I'll be talking about um, from critical race theory. Um, and so I'm sure most of us would agree that we wield tremendous power um, to produce new knowledge. Um, and this is particularly for those of us who are situated um, in universities, in institutions of higher education, and particularly in schools of public health. 
Um, but when we, but when knowledge production is presumed to be value free, white cultural norms, assumptions, and methods are likely to dominate research while viable non-mainstream approaches and understandings remain marginalized. So currently it is the case that uh, data availability determine the questions that we ask um, and not the other way around. Um, and then they also determines the questions that we leave on the table, right? Uh, funding determines our research priorities like we talked about with the NIH and genetic uh, versus genetic uh, determinants versus social determinants. Um, and job security or the lack thereof determines folks' research agendas. But from the perspective of critical race theory and taking the position that all knowledge um, is value laden, either explicitly or implicitly, might open up our the opportunity for us to make changes in how we perpetuate racism um, and how we produce different kinds of knowledge um, coming out of schools and colleges of public health. So what if, for example, we changed our curriculum to center the role of racism, capitalism, and other structures of inequality in health disparities research? What if we fully funded students who are studying racism and other forms of structural oppression? What if we supported scholars who do community engaged work? And what I mean by that is really supported scholars, like financially um, and otherwise. What if we, when we put out job postings for uh, scholars of racism and health equity, that we actually hire scholars of racism and health equity <laughs> rather than continuing our system of nepotism in hiring practices that is very rampant throughout um, higher ed? And what if? Uh, we were as critical of our own methods, our own theories, and our own data collection strategies as we were of scholars who work on racism, right? The scholars that we continue to marginalize. So these are all ways that we can influence the production of knowledge uh, that is coming out of our schools, out of our colleges, and our programs of public health. Um, so critical race theory provides us with tools to think critically about how we as public health researchers, students, scholars, and professionals reinforce racism within and outside of our discipline and what we can do about it. So with that, I will end. Um, but I wanna thank you for your time. Um, I think we can start taking questions from the chat. Um, and if there are additional questions um, that we don't get to, I'm happy to continue the conversation on Twitter, or if you wanna email me, you can do that as well. Um, so again, I hope that this can be a conversation starter um, or an action starter um, so that we can really think about the ways that we can um, change how we do public health um, and population health research and um, hold ourselves accountable. Thanks again. That was just so fabulous. Thank you. I, I get to I get to hop on and verbally say that first. Um, those were and also I'm going to mention that there's been some interest in your slides and if you could make those available maybe after this. I've gotten like a couple private and then there's been one public message like these are really good uh, because this this really is fantastic. Um, I'm well, I, I well, people kind of get their thoughts together about what questions to ask. I, I wanted to start off with um, that that circle chart you had about the the loop of a racist incident happens, we talk about it, and then we revert to normal. Um, what what are your big recommendations to break that cycle? I know you shared the, the tweet with Dr. Along about making sure that there is retention and structural support, but, but is there anything else that um, you would like to see at institutions like, like the University of Minnesota School of Public Health and that student advocates, and also I know I've seen some professors' names on here, I've seen some alumni names here, like what should we use our voices to promote? Um, so I think there's a there's a number of things. First, I would say um, one, it's not just voices. So I think folks have been um, very vocal, particularly in the last year or so, um, about one what it means to be anti-racist, um, what it means to do anti-racist work. Um, but I think at some point we have to kind of move beyond sharing tweets, we have to move beyond, you know, black squares on Instagram, right? And actually do 
do things. So, so there are very tangible things that are go that's going on in a lot of universities um, that can really change the material lives of students, of faculty, of staff, um, and of people who are living in the surrounding communities. So one example that I can think of is there's a lot of student organizing going on right now across the country. The University of California is one of those, um, one of those sites. Um, Columbia University, NYU, um, where students are really asking, demanding for living wages, for childcare, um, for housing subsidies, like all of these things. It's, um, it's pretty amazing that you can go to school in Los Angeles, which is one of the most expensive cities in the world and get a stipend of $20,000 and supposed to be happy about it, right? Um, so what I would like to see is for institutions particularly faculty um, who, who have a lot more power, or at least in my mind as a student, faculty have a lot more power um, to, to make their voices heard um, in those kinds of fights, um, or in, these, in these student organizing efforts. So I, I would like to see a lot more of that. In addition to that, um, there's this fabulous book. Do I have it on me? Yes, that I started reading. Um, and it is called In the Shadow of the Ivory Tower. And I can add this to the reading list that I have. Um, and it is by um, uh, Devarian Brown, uh, Baldwin, excuse me, Devarian Baldwin, who is a, um, an urbanist. Um, and he wrote this book and it's basically about how universities, um, and he talked about University of Chicago and Columbia and a bunch of other schools, um, how they're basically destroying the, or he uses the word plundering, um, our cities. And so the communities that are existing, that have existed um, before these universities um, became like these kind of mega cities themselves, um, are being harmed by the actions of universities, right? And so what institutions can do is to be more vocal and to stand with the communities that are being impacted by the, by the very institutions that, that are in their community. So those are just like two things that I can, that I can think of at the top of my head. I should unmute myself. That's excellent. Um, yeah, I, I think that's, that's those, those structural changes are so important. I know also at the University of Minnesota, something that has been a recent issue for student student leadership is, uh, I say recent, um, it's, it's been a while. Um, we are really trying to get the University of Minnesota to cut ties with the um, uh, universities. Please. Yeah, uh, especially given that um, just a few weeks ago, our campus police were sent to Brooklyn Center as part of the response to um, protesters against the killing of Dante Wright. So there's just a lot of things that um, obviously you, you discussed these critical areas of just being able to live and have a living wage and take care of your children. Um, and I think there's also on this campus because of some of the structural choices, just things that make it's scary to be on campus if you're not a white lady like me and that's not good that's that's very bad and that's something we're continuing to advocate for and i see that there is a question uh two questions ruth would you like to unmute and ask this yourself or would you like me to read it for you sure no i'm happy thanks keila um so thank you so much for that presentation it was it was it was great um, I teach in the School of Public Health as a senior lecturer. I teach ethics. I also teach law. So I'm, I'm kind of aware of critical race theory from that perspective. But the question I have for you is in the field of ethics, there is a field called narrative ethics, which is really focused on storytelling and often counter stories because it's looking at the stories of patients whose voices are often not heard, as well as healthcare providers, especially residents whose voices are not heard. And even within medicine, there's a field kind of called narrative medicine. And so my question for you is, I have never come across any corollary to that in public health. You know, it's sort of public health narrative um, focus. Um, and I don't know if that's just because public health is so population oriented, but I just wanted to throw that question out to you and see if you have any thoughts. I think that's, I mean, 
I too have not heard of um, a public health narrative like field. Um, I do know there are a number of scholars who um, are public health ethnographers mm -hmm. um, and public who, who you know specialize in qualitative data collection and qualitative data analysis. Um, but I'm also not aware of any subfield that is narrative focused or counter story focused. Um, I do know that in so the, in the field of education, there are a number of uh, folks who are using critical uh, race theory and doing counter stories to basically talk about how racism operates in um, the field of education. And I think we have a po the potential to do that in public health too, right? Because a lot of the work, particularly around racial health disparities, treats um, racialized minorities as um, the treats us from a de deficit model, right? And so what a counter story would do is to flip that and to look at, you know, how, um, how have, you know, certain communities thrived amidst all of these other things that are going on, right? How have they um, continued to build coalitions um, despite being hunted by the police, despite, um, you know, not having adequate housing and despite all these other things, right? We look at for example, um, the Moms for Housing movement in Oakland, right? They were able to basically squat in this house that was uh, just sitting empty. Um, and these moms were able to win this house legally. Um, and so like we need those types of stories to be to be considered and to be incorporated into mainstream public health as well. So I think that's a great question and I am not yet aware, but I would love to see that be a subfield in public health. Thank you. Samantha, would you be willing to unmute yourself and talk a little bit more about that project you mentioned in the chat? Yeah, um, Rebecca, I just wanted to, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, Rebecca, I just wanted to thank you so much for giving this talk. Um, I was really excited to sort of hear you talk about um, the use of race as like a social construct, how we use it you know, kind of as a surrogate for for um, like biological or genetic factors without really thinking about the core issues. Because right now um, I'm part of a group, um, Hmong Public Health Association. And what we're trying to do right now is actually to get uh, government systems to disaggregate the data. Because if you look at um, who is impacted by COVID at this point, you'll see like, oh, Asians are doing fine. But actually, you know, if you, separate those, you know, the Asian groups out into like East Asians, South Asians, you know, Southeast Asians. Um, specifically, we were looking at um, Hmong and Karen. And um, if you pull those out, you notice that like Hmong people are really negatively impacted by, by what's going on with COVID, but you would never be able to tell that. And the resources are limited to that, like limited to Asian folks, because it looks like, you know, Asians are doing relatively okay in the mm -hmm. pandemic. And what I was just really impressed about is like, I was just thinking in my head, like, okay, if we can just get, if we can just get, you know, a government to not just put Asian to put like Hmong in there, then we've won it. But you are completely, completely correct that we can't just, you know, be complacent with, you know, having Hmong on there because that never really gets to the core issues going on, you know, the, the policy, the racial injustices going on. So I just wanted to thank you because it, it really sort of opened my mind to that. Mm -hmm. Of course, you're welcome. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And, and so another theme that I didn't include here um, that is uh, a critical race theory theme is the theme of differential racialization. So right? that's exactly what you're talking about is that different groups have different racializing experiences in the United States. So even though, you know, racism is this ubiquitous thing, it doesn't impact everyone in the same exact way. Even group, even people that we kind of lump into uh, black don't have the same racialization experiences. Even people that we lump into Asian because of, you know, immigration laws and things of that nature um, don't have the same racialization experiences. And so um, in order to tease apart why certain groups are having the health outcomes that we're seeing, we can't just, you know, fall back on this 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 kind of core concept of race um, as we as we know it and as we use it today. So thank you for for um, lifting up that study.
and as, as we're getting another question and I also wanted to say, I didn't mention this. So this QR code that's on the screen is not just there to be cute. Uh, it is a, a link to a reading list um, from a bunch of articles and books that I have read throughout, you know, the course of my program um, and that have really helped inform the way that I think about um, these, these issues and these topics. And so um, if you scan the code, it'll take you to a Google folder, a Google Drive folder, and you'll see the reading list as well as some of the PDFs for, um, for, from that reading list. And I think Keely is going to send it out later on uh, with the recording as well. I also want to post, I think it's so great that you have that reading list and I'm posting a few more resources um, to get involved immediately and especially for students who at the University of Minnesota, like me, are in finals and tired and don't have a lot of extra energy right now, but summer is almost here. And um, especially if you are looking for ways to get involved in community activism and supporting the rest of the Twin Cities. Uh, there are some resources there that have um, ways to directly get involved with the communities. Um, and I, I kind of, I'm sorry, I have a couple other questions bubbling, but I really wanna make sure it's not just me talking and I, I wanna give a little bit of a pause to let anyone who has a question either type it or unmute. Um, okay, but I'm gonna, I, I, I thank you for letting, this is, the, this is the nice thing for everyone watching. This is why you should host everything. Oh, Lindsay, you go, go ahead. I still get to, I still get to talk more, so you should go first. <laughs> thanks, Kelia. And Rebecca, this is a great presentation. Um, thanks for, I think you did a really great job of kind of explaining critical race theory, especially for me as someone who's new and, and learning about it. Um, I think you really helped to highlight kind of the, the tenets of the theory and the points and, and thinking about ways to think about and study race, specifically racism and its effects on health. Um, and I'm thinking about just for those of us who do research consistently or thinking about doing research and moving into a space where we're moving from studying race um, as a, a variable kind of on the right-hand side of the equation um, related to some sort of outcome to thinking about the impacts of the social construct of race and racism specifically. So we do our research and we publish it and it goes into some space uh, on PubMed, right, that maybe has made an impact and maybe it gets retweets or reviews or is cited numerous times. Um, but then it usually, like most research that's done, ends up sitting somewhere on a shelf. Um, and it might not have the impact that we want it to have in terms of long-term sustainable changes to how folks interact with the system, how folks, or how, not even how folks interact with the system, how systems get changed. And so I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on, um, for those of us that are doing research in, in racism, thinking about integrating critical race theory or other theories of how um, the social construct of race impacts um, health, um, what are the ways that we can have more long-term meaningful change to the systems that um, have such terrible effects on the health of, of Black and Brown folks um, so that it doesn't just become an article that is published and that we get kudos for, but that we actually get to systems where the systems themselves are actually anti-racist? That is a question right there. <laughs> that is, I think that's the question, right? So um, thank you, Lindsay, for that, for that um, provocation. Um, and it's, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's an easy answer, right? I don't think there's like a, 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 a number of steps that we can take. Okay, if we do A, B, and C, then, you know, the systems change, right? Um, and sometimes we are a part of the systems that are the problem, right? <laughs> um, so sometimes it is, the university that is causing the problem, right? The university police, for example, or um, sometimes it is a particular department that is very um, uh, exploitative, 
um, to students, to community, whatever. Um, and so it's hard to, to hold that tension to be a part of a system that you wanna change, but also you need to eat and you need to feed your family and you need to pay rent or pay your mortgage or whatever the case may be. Um, and so those things are very real. Um, so I would say uh, what I try to do um, is to you know think about uh, my research as a job um, and to think about ways that I can kind of use the skills um, and the talents and the resources that I have from this job and kind of infiltrate that into uh, the community. You're not infiltrated into the community, use it to support community members in the work that they're already doing, um, right? So it's kind of like, instead of you know having universities go into communities and exploit communities, I'm like, taking the resources from the community, I mean, from the university and kind of use, trying to use it to benefit communities. And so sometimes that looks like being a part of community-based community -based organizations, being a part of movements on the ground, um, mutual aid funds, um, a lot of things that, you know, we have to kind of do the, 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 the hard long-term on the ground nitty gritty work of organizing to change systems um, because it's not going to just happen in the ivory tower. It's not just going to happen on PubMed. Um, but I do think there's a role for research, right? I do think that, you know, praxis is the inter interplay of um, theory and practice. And so we have to have both, right? Um, you know, your theory kind of informs the practices that you do. And then the practice kind of makes the theory kind of more real and on the ground. And so you can't have one without the other. So I think to the extent that I can, I try to do work that feeds my spirit, um, one, and that I think is going to be helpful. And what determines whether something is helpful is if people in the communities that I care about tell me that it's helpful, not if I just think that this is something cool to do and I just really wanna see what these models might look like if I switch out these variables, but that it's actually going to matter for people. Um, another thing that you could tangibly do um, is like pro bono research work. So a lot of community-based organizations don't have the money to pay evaluators or they don't have the money to um, you know, pay for like research systems for their organization. And you know, with the skills that we have as researchers, we can do some like some pro bono work for these community-based organizations that are um, really trying to make change um, in these systems. So I think there's a number of things. Um, there's no, I don't think there's like a sweeping, you know, these, this is what academics can do because I, I don't think the revolution is going to happen in the ivory tower. Um, so there's that, but I do think that we can take our, our tools and our skills and our resources that we've gained in the university and try to um, basically kind of Robin Hood it and, and and, and support the communities that we care about. Well, I am gonna sneak in and ask a question that I always try to ask people who do the kind of amazing work that you do. Um, how do you practice self-care? Cause this mm. can get heavy. Uh, structural racism, structural oppression is heavy. Um, and you just said, I, I actually wrote it down, I try to do work that feeds my spirit, which is so beautiful. But, you know, how, how do you take care of all of you? You've got part of, that's part of how you take care of your spirit. How do you practice self-care? That is a great question. Um, so I uh, have a two-year-old, <laughs> um, well, she'll be two in June. Um, her name is Naomi and she's amazing. And so I spend, I try to spend as much time with her as possible. Um, and, uh, but that's kind of like family care, right? That's not self-care. Um, but uh, I practice yoga regularly um, is one thing that I have, I probably started my practice about five years ago. Um, LA is a very yoga friendly place. <laughs> so I started getting um, into yoga when I was, when I moved to LA and um, um, it has really been transformative in terms of how I um, deal with my anxiety um, and how I kind of can, can center um, the, the things that I need for myself and, to my, and my spirit. So um, that is one thing that I do 
and get outside as often as I can um, when, you know, when the weather is nice and warm, um, which is why I'm like, you know, I would love to be in Minnesota at some point to visit you all, but I need the warmth. So, so trying to get outside and, and just be in nature and breathe fresh air, but yoga is definitely what I, what I do to um, take care of myself and journal. I try to journal every day. That's excellent. And especially for any any young, younger researchers or students. Also, how I practice self-care is I play with my cat who <laughs> keeps wanting to jump up on my keyboard. Um, but uh, I think that's just so valuable um, for for the especially the younger the students and the like early professionals and early researchers. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, I want to time to go. Okay. Um, I want to hold space. We've got a couple minutes left. Are there any final burning questions that you have for Rebecca? Also, I'm, I, again, I'm happy to, um, like I said, continue the conversation on Twitter um, if folks have questions. Um, and I'm also um, available via email. I will probably respond slowly to email, not going to lie. Um, but um, I'm happy to answer um, questions that folks have, like that want that you want to be more private uh, via email. Well, I think with that, I, I we're already, so I think instead of questions, I hope you can see the chat, we're just getting I some expressions of gratitude. And I want to echo that though. This is, I, I so like, kind of uh, full disclosure to everyone. So this is the last structural oppression seminar of this semester. This has been my my kind of my, my, my project, my baby this, this whole semester. And Rebecca is the first person I contacted. I was like, I want this to be a thing and I need her to be <laughs> in it. Uh, and I just, I was like, this is why, like, do you understand now everyone who's in the audience? This is why I wanted to have her be a part of this. And I'm just so grateful Thank that you me. shared all of this with us and for all of the work you do. And yeah, this is this is just so excellent. And to everyone, we will be sending you the recording when we have it. Uh, that link to that excellent folder is in the, the chat. And just thank you so much. And I think uh, I'll end the recording unless there's any final comments you, you wanna make, Rebecca. No, thank you all for coming. Um, uh, I know Zoom has been a lot. It is a lot for me as well. As you can see, my eyes are quite low. Um, so <laughs> I'm, I'm over Zoom as much as you are. For, so for those of you whose semesters are coming to an end, I hope that you all have a um, relaxing and rejuvenating summer. And for those of us who are on the quarter system, I will continue to pray for us because <laughs> we still have a <laughs> So, um, so yeah, thank you all for, for spending your, your Friday with us and um, yeah, hope to hear from you soon. Please stay in touch.